Jeffrey. Hey, it's so great to be here and see your smiling faces. Yeah, there's a few. <laughs> so early in the morning, we'll get you going. And I'm really excited because I look around and even though I don't know many of you individually, I kind of feel like I know you. Like I feel like you are here because you're interested in sort of the state of the art in web technology and design and development. You want to create great work. You want to leave a legacy. You want to do important things and make the world a little better and maybe a little more well-designed. <laughs> I can appreciate that. And I can appreciate that because that also feels like me. Like so much of what I've done in my career has been about trying to stay one step ahead of everything, trying to understand what's the newest, what's the latest, what's the greatest, and keep up with that. And I've gotten the chance, really, through so much fortune, to work with all kinds of great brands, um, both as an employee, that's sort of the bottom part, and as a consultant and speaker and advisor. So I've gotten to compare uh, how these types of principles that I'm going to talk with you about apply in different environments, and they do. They apply in every environment I've ever encountered, so they will apply in yours, I'm happy to tell you. And what the, the principle is, is that right now is a moment when we really need to be thinking about this idea that technology is moving really fast, it's changing a lot of things, it's breaking a lot of things, and humanity is kind of in the way <laughs> of this progress. So we need to reconcile these things more, and we need to make them make sense together. And that's kind of the, the gist of what I'm going to talk about with you, but that's how I have arrived at my career. But I also feel, in thinking about where you are in what you're doing, that perhaps maybe that's a little bit how you might be feeling about this too, that you might want to take a more humanist view in the technology work that you're doing. And if so, you're in luck, because I'm going to try to help you uh, develop some principles that you can apply in your work. So as Jeffrey mentioned, I have a new book. It just came out uh, about two weeks ago, Tech Humanist. And when you see that title, I want you to think that she's not, she's not describing just herself. She's describing me, right? You, in other words. I want you to feel that Tech Humanist is describing you, because it is. I think that's the most important thing about this, is that you need to feel empowered to make the world better by integrating the needs of technology and humanity. So let's pause right there and, and explain why this is so important. So think about all of the machine-driven forces that are happening right now, automation, artificial intelligence, robots, you know, all those kinds of things. Even when you say them together at the same time, it sounds a little intimidating. <laughs> like, that's kind of a lot, right? And it's changing the world really fast. Like, 70 to 80% of CEOs say that they believe the next three years are more critical than the past 50 years. So it's a lot of change. It's happening really fast. And I'm, I'm working with a lot of companies who are actually doing robotic process automation now and have been for some time. So this kind of job displacement and replacement and augmentation and all of the acceleration of business and experiences is really happening. I think the biggest impact on it is going to be on our human experiences. And as people who design human experiences, what I want to do is help you think about how to design experiences now for the web, for interactive, for whatever the, the kind of channel or platform that you currently think about designing within as it evolves into a more automated, more machine-driven, more uh, artificially intelligent platform. Because it's going to. I'm here to tell you. It is going to. The work you're doing now is going to become automated. So I'm going to give you some, some guidance on how to get there and how to think about that. Because as we get there, as we take this, this opportunity to build technology at scale, what we have the opportunity to do is create the best futures for the most people. That is kind of our ethical imperative out of all of this, is that if all of this technology can create scale, then why wouldn't we use it to create scale that benefits as many people as possible? So that's the opportunity. So to step back just a little bit and understand if we're thinking about the best futures for the most people, what do I mean by people or what am I talking about when I talk about human in the humanist? Like, why is that an important component or an important thing to understand? Well, let's pause for a moment and just think about what it is that makes humans human. 
if you will, just think of one characteristic, one word or characteristic that, for you, kind of typifies what makes humans human. That one kind of defining characteristic. And I won't ask you to shout it out or anything, but I will see if I have predicted what your answer might be. So how many of you, by a show of hands, thought of something like creativity or problem solving? Okay, there's a few folks in the room. That's about 10% maybe. And that's pretty typical, so that's great. And I love that characteristic. It's a good one for sure. How about um, empathy or love or compassion? It's maybe more like half the room or so. That's a good one too, of course. How many of you thought of checking a box? No hands? <laughs> no, of course not, because that's absurd. And that's not how we define our humanity. And anyway, even if we did, that wouldn't really be uniquely <laughs> ours. <laughs> uh, have you guys seen this guy before? <laughs> and the thing is, even those other characteristics aren't uniquely ours either. Animals, the other than humans, have been known to d demonstrate creativity, like, you know, otters bang mollusks on rocks to open them, and ravens use tools, and elephants and dogs have been known to be very affectionate and loving with each other, so that it's possible that those are not uniquely human characteristics. <clears throat> and they may not necessarily be characteristics that machines can't simulate in some way. Uh, well, <laughs> problem solving is maybe a little bit of an overstatement for what this is, but eventually we may see superficial characteristics of machines demonstrating some kind of problem solving or something that looks like empathy at a very superficial level. So this tension between meaning and absurdity, like why, why do we look at a uh, confirmed humanity checkbox as some kind of uh, validation of our humanity? Well, there's a lot of absurdity that enters into the, the technology experience. There's a whole lot of it. We, uh, we do this constantly. If you think about it at work, you have probably a vocabulary that you would never use with your friends outside of work. That's absurd. There's words you say at work that just make sense there but your friends would be like, what are you talking about? And there's things that are just like the way it's always been done. All these things are kind of absurd, and I have this kind of idea about this relationship between meaning and absurdity, that the opportunity is to create meaning so that it crowds out absurdity, because if you don't create an understanding of meaning, absurdity will crowd it out. Where you don't create meaning, it sort of creates a void into which absurdity can flow, <laughs> in other words. And that, for me, is the most defining characteristic of humanity. Is my, my answer to that question is that humans crave meaning. We seek it. We thrive on it. We are compelled by it. And when we find it, when it's offered to us, we find it irresistible. So in all of our endeavors to create experiences for humans, we should really be thinking about how to create more meaningful experiences. How many um, Douglas Adams fans in the room? Okay, that's uh, about half, that's cool. Uh, so you'll know immediately what I'm gonna say. But the rest of you maybe uh, may not be as familiar, but in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, Douglas Adams had written that the answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything was? 42. 42. Which, in interviews since then, Douglas Adams said that he chose that number because it was not too high and not too low, and it was just funny, <laughs> which it is. Uh, but so it's obviously, you know, doesn't mean anything, except that a whole subculture has sprung up since then of people trying to uh, sort of carve out alternate explanations for why 42 actually kind of makes sense. If you look on Reddit and look this up, you will find an entire page of explanations. I'll give you a few of my favorites. One was that there's 42 characters in the phrase, it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Convinced? Or how about there's 42 dots on a pair of dice? <laughs> I always thought that one was just kind of a, a throwaway funny one, and then my husband was like, yeah, but life is kind of like a roll of the dice. So... <laughs> Like, all right, fair enough. But my favorite is this one, that 
Apparently, 42 is the Unicode value for the asterisk symbol, which in computing, as you probably know, is often used as a wildcard character, which means it can mean anything. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's apparently just a coincidence. It's an amazing and beautiful and poetic coincidence, but it is a coincidence nonetheless. So in the absence of such a unified and concise and poetic and silly explanation for everything, we have to make meaning the way we always have and always do, which is by existing in the world, understanding context, ascribing different significance to different events based on how and how much we value them. Easy enough, right? Or in other words, just sort of making it up as we go along. Which is cool and exciting because you get pretty much any meaning of meaning is, this is true for, from the semantic, you know, just how we communicate with each other and what we're trying to express, all the way out to like the existential and cosmic, like what's it all about, Alfie, sort of questions. And you guys probably work somewhere in the patterns and significance and status layer most of the time in, in the work that you're doing, but it's good to be aware of this whole spectrum of meaning and how these things really interrelate with one another and how much potential there is to be conscious and mindful about the meaning we are creating and constructing for other people and for our relationships with them as we create experiences. Because what's really empowering is to think about the whole human experience broader than how we typically talk about it. We typically talk about user experience or customer experience or depending on the industry you're in, maybe patient experience, visitor experience, guest experience. But what about if you think about all of that as being an integrated part of the human experience which is holistic and has this broader context? And when you do that, you get this very empowering opportunity to think in an integrated way about what people are really experiencing in the world and the power here is that in order to create meaningful human experiences, we really must design more integrated human experiences. They have to come together. They have to be aware of where someone is in the world, literally, as well as kind of philosophically and psychologically. Those things have to be part of the understanding that we bring to experience design. One of the reasons for that is that the design of experiences online now regularly intersects with the design of experiences offline, as you probably know. In your work, it's probably already true. If it, isn't, if it hasn't become already true, it will become true very soon that you will have to think about how someone is going to experience what you are creating, what you're designing in the form of a mobile app or on a watch. I keep looking at this. Jeffrey made this joke yesterday. I keep looking at the magic band as if it's a, a watch, like, oh. That's, a, that's an interesting mobile display you've got there, Mickey. But <laughs> you've got to be able to think about this kind of multimodal opportunity for your content, for your experience. And, you know, the fact that screenless is so, uh, so emerging. Like, you're going to have voice-driven interactions and, and conversational interfaces, chatbots, and so on. If you aren't already designing those, you will. And it's going to need to in incorporate many of the same constructs and ideals that have been discussed all this week and will be discussed all this week, as well as much of this understanding of meaning and integration. And the main thing is that just about everywhere that the physical world and digital world connect, that connection layer happens through us, through our human experience. It's critically important to think about that. We are the people who are going out there in the world and being tracked. It's our data that is merging those physical layers and those digital layers. So we need to, do, we need to see that with a, a whole lot of respect for the, human, the humanity in that data. This is what I wrote about in my book, Pixels in Place. Uh, so that's, that's that point is, is about connected experiences and the Internet of Things and smart devices and wearables and beacons and sensors and that whole emerging space. But what that really showed me is that it's just this bigger picture of integration that we're really talking about there. This bigger picture of integration, this bigger opportunity to think about how a thing over here and a thing over here that seem like they're in opposition to one another actually have a yes and, actually have a both and approach. That when you take that both and approach, you get something far more powerful like platypus guitar. 
I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is like the world's greatest Venn diagram. The credit is there at the bottom in case anybody wants to look like Tensa Graphics or something. Um, they sell t-shirts. So I hope that the next time I see you at the next an event apart, you're all wearing the Platypus Kitar t-shirt. But the approach here is to think about integration of what seems like opposite ideals and opposite forces. And in this case, a lot of the work that I've done over the last few years is to take business objectives, like how do we scale the business, how do we make the business more effective, more profitable, more efficient, and balance them with human objectives, like how do we make the customer experience better, how do we make this a more meaningful experience, how do we make sure that people are having the most dimensional understanding of the brand and of the culture that's being represented by the company, and, and all of that. So the more we kind of create the answer on one side of the equation, and the more it helps us clarify the answer on the other side of the equation. And these are very self-fulfilling, self-feeding cycles. And then the big question is always, what about the money? <laughs> Does this really pay off? Do, doesn't it cost a lot more to take this kind of holistic approach? Aren't we being slow and too methodical about this whole thing? And does it really pay? Well, the good news is that you do actually see an increase in customer loyalty. You see a decrease in churn. You see an increase in employee morale and employee retention, uh, the, in, an increase in the ability to uh, attract and retain top talent. So if you're talking to your executives, your, your uh, bosses and executive team about bringing back this idea like, hey, we need to be thinking more holistically about the technology we design. We need to be thinking about humanity at a broader level. And they say, well, that sounds good in principle. You can go, yeah, but it also means more profit. And then you'll have their ear. <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> so the approach is this. I, I have this uh, um, model that I in, uh, introduced in Pixels in Plays called Integrated Human Experience Design. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to get to uh, what I built from this, which is the automated approach to integrated human experience design. But the integrated part we're talking about here is that online and offline, all context together, and the human that goes beyond those roles, the customer and user roles. Experience, meaning an inter intentional layer of transactions and interactions. And design, note how I'm, how I'm defining this word here, as the adaptive execution of strategic intent. So the implication is you're going to be doing this iteratively. You're going to be trying things, and you're going to be fixing as you go. You're going to be adapting and learning. This whole thing should be a learning process, for sure. The elements of integrated human experience design, uh, I'll just quickly pull up on screen here. Um, are, are many, and also I want to call your attention to the quote at the bottom there, all models are false, but some are useful. My favorite, George E.P. Box. So the elements I've identified here may or may not be comprehensive as this model uh, uh, describes your environment. As you try to think about how to create integrative experiences that are meaningful, that are dimensional, that are purposeful, in solving your business problems or the design challenges that you're faced with, with solving, you may or may not find these to be the elements that particularly help you solve it. And I'd love to know if there are other elements that for you help clarify that. So please do reach out to me uh, when you find that out. And I'm Kate O on Twitter, by the way, in case anyone wants to uh, send me feedback that way. I'd love to hear it. One of the other elements or other principles to this is that there is this kind of inherent nature versus shape dichotomy to experience. And this has come up again and again in the work I've been doing, that humans ha have an, an ongoing experience throughout time, which does not change all that much, and that is the nature of experience. And the shape of experience is constantly evolving. So <laughs> as in this example, we know we need water. Right? We all need to drink water. I probably could stand to drink some right now. Um, but the, the shape of the consumption of that water could be different. Like, I could package that water up into a thick glass bottle and put this kind of minimalistic logo, typeface sort of thing, and give it this sort of hipster aesthetic, and it'll probably sell for a bunch of bucks. And you know, everybody will feel kind of aspirational and cool because they're drinking this, this like hipster cool 
kind of bottled water, but you know, maybe it's the same water that's over here in the glass. That's sort of the gist of the nature versus the shape of experience. And I think it's a really important uh, concept to, to hold on to because we're constantly changing the, the approach to, to uh, shapes. Shapes are constantly changing. We see a lot of evolution in the way people approach, like the eating of food, for example. Like, when's the last time you ate a meal without taking a picture of it? I can't remember. <laughs> but there's, a, there's an interesting thing about that. We've learned that people actually remember better what they've eaten when they take a photo of it, and they, but they also don't remember their surroundings or the people that they're with as well. So there's a trade-off there. You have a tendency to remember the food, but not the people or where you were. There's just a change to the way that that experience is consumed and had by people. But it's still eating. We're all still eating. So the nature still remains. OK. But then we have to think about now, once we've created these integrated experiences, and once we've thought about the dimensionality of them and how they're going to go from one modality to another modality, how somebody's going to experience them in one context and another, we have to know that eventually the data comes back to the company, we see results from the experiments we run, and we think like, now it's time to actually automate this and make it more effective. Let's say you're running a chatbot. Let's say you've got a, a florist as a, as a business, and you have experimented with, a, uh, with an, a chat interaction, and maybe it was just a, a toy sort of experiment. It was just like a, a sort of ruse of a, a pseudo chatbot. But it worked, and people were actually using it and placing orders, and so now you really have to think about how to make this thing robust. Here's how we make this thing robust. Well, I want to make sure that what we're trying to do is creating more meaningful machine-led human experiences as we go here. So the premise is uh, to do this, to create the kind of experiences that will scale, that will create the most uh, potential for meaning, we can automate the me meaningful and not just the menial, and I'll get to that in a second. We can automate empathy. We can use human data. We must use human data respectfully, and we should reinvest the gains that we get from automation into humanity and human experiences. I'll go through each one of these in more detail. So with automation, in the, the circles that I usually am in, with like executives who work around operations, and uh, marketing and IT, a lot of time the discussion tends to run about automation that they want to automate the, the premises, let's automate all the menial stuff, all the meaningless tasks, so that humans can do higher order work, which sounds good in principle. It sounds great. Except when you take that idea out to scale and you try to imagine what does the world look like in a few years once everything has become automated around us and it's all menial, meaningless crap, no one has thought about how to make sure that all these automated experiences have some degree of meaning or human value or empathy or sort of nuance to them. I think there has to be a both and here. This is an integration problem. We have to make sure we are integrating the menial stuff and the meaningless stuff and let humans do higher order work for sure. But we also have to see where some of the meaningful connections are being made what's happening in the, in the business interactions that's creating a sense of human connection, and try to experiment with automating that too, to take that to scale, so that people will have the opportunity to feel a sense of connection at scale. Believe me, those jobs are going to go away too, eventually. It's not my call to make, it's just what's going to happen. We want to make sure there's as much meaning in those experiences as that happens. So we can use data and technology to scale the experiences that we create, not just for efficiency, but for meaning. We have to think about how to model that. We have to think about how we're going to measure the experiences we design and create so that we get a sense of what is meaningful about them. It's going to be difficult to do. I'm not going to lie to you, but there are proxies for meaningfulness. Memorability, for example, is a proxy for meaningfulness. If someone can remember an experience you created for them or something about it, there's a good chance that you created something that approached meaningful for them. 
Another useful part of, the, of thinking about the meaningfulness of automated experiences is to think about this relationship between metaphor and metadata. So the underlying uh, metaphor that shapes the experience, like what you're trying to create and how you're trying to let people have a cognitive association with it, that needs to have a nice tight relationship with the underlying structure of the data that, that shapes and informs those interactions. I think the easiest way to explain this is an example I stole from Airbnb. Uh, so Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky was uh, announcing a new campaign that Airbnb was launching a couple of years ago uh, called Don't Go There, Live There. I don't know if anybody saw that. Uh, very cool idea, I thought. But one of the things he used to explain it <clears throat> was this idea that if you were to compare the expert uh, locals on Airbnb with the tourists who had visited a place on TripAdvisor and like what their top recommendations were, you would see a vastly different set of recommendations. So on one hand, like so for Paris, as what's shown here, the locals who were the hosts in Airbnb in Paris had given a set of recommendations that for all but one differed completely with, uh, with the tourists who had come to TripAdvisor, which of course fit the t sort of typical bucket list, you know, got to make sure we go to the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and whatnot. And the, and the Luxembourg Gardens is of course the one exception where it overlaps, which is my favorite place in Paris, so I feel really vindicated about that. But see, what's interesting here is that the metaphor about not going there, living there, is perfectly represented by these two lists. The going there, the doing Paris, the checking things off your bucket list version of Paris is the TripAdvisor. The living there is the Airbnb experience of Paris. And they say there, don't go there, live there, even if it's just for one night. So even if you're just in Paris for one night, you're approaching it like, this is not a city to do. This is a city to experience. And think about how the metadata, the data of this, this query supports this, this uh, approach. Because it's the same city, they have the same landmarks in either query, but they're weighting different things to produce this list. To produce the list on the TripAdvisor side, it's about raw popularity. To produce the list on the Airbnb side, it's about authority and credibility uh, of the locals and giving weight to those locals. Does that make sense? The metaphor and metadata relationship? It's a really important part of getting this to come to life. Because it, what it leads to is this sense of strategic purpose, which is a distillation of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to do at scale. And that leads to a more purposeful strategy, which may sound like a tautology, but I promise you is not. It leads to a, cl a clearer path to prioritization, to resource allocation, to being able to have a, a conversation with the rest of your team about who does what and uh, what you're gonna do first and what's most important because if you understand what you're trying to do and how you can articulate that, you can actually have everybody be on the same page about how you're gonna get there. And I think this is a really fun time to Look at one of my favorite examples of this. Disney theme parks has one of the most famous uh, examples of a strategic purpose. In, uh, in their work, they have articulated create magical experiences as their strategic purpose. Create magical experiences. Just that simple, three words. But yet think about, when you think about digital transformation and investments in technology deployment, how easy it must have been to be able to spend a billion plus dollars on these My Magic bands that now do create magical experiences for everyone, that can open doors and pay for things and provide all kinds of personalization information at the different way, way stations along the way. Everybody enjoying wearing their uh, $1 billion investment on your wrist? It's pretty cool. Did you know that it was a billion dollars that Disney spent? Okay. Uh, I think that's pretty cool because I think a lot of times executives are struggling going like, how are we, what are we going to spend money on? How are we going to prioritize the decisions we're going to make with technology deployment and how are we going to transform our business to be ready for, di for digital and to scale? And this is just a perfect illustration of how you get there. It's about designing experiences that are aligned with strategic purpose so that purpose can scale. And purpose is the shape meaning takes in business. So it all comes full circle. Humans crave meaning, 
the shape meaning takes in business is purpose. And I'm not talking about touchy-feely purpose, I'm talking about clarity of intent. I'm talking about what it is you're trying to do so that everybody's on the same page. And what do I mean by so that it can scale? Well, normally when we talk about scale in terms of startups or corporate growth, we're talking about removing hard limits so the growth opportunities can flourish. And usually we're talking about things in terms of multiples, like 3x or 5x or whatever. But in a machine-led economy and in machine-led experiences, there really are no limits. So we're talking about potentially exponential expansion uh, when we're looking at automation and AI. So we really have to think about the strategic decisions we make, about the design decisions they make, so that we're scaling the most meaningful things for humanity. And we can't let absurdity become what scales, like the confirm humanity checkbox. That's absurd. We have to make sure that we're being intentional about meaning so it crowds out absurdity and doesn't give absurdity that chance to scale. Let me give you an example of what I think it looks like when absurdity does scale. Now, how many of you are familiar with this Amazon Go store concept? It's most of you, right? Uh, this launched in January, and since then, I think maybe just a couple weeks ago, you may have heard that Amazon announced that they have plans to have maybe 3,000 of these or so by 2021. So it's a lot. It's a lot of stores that are going to be out there. I think it's really cool, honestly. But this is this whole uh, don't stop, just walk out sort of uh, checkout experience. You uh, just walk in. It's a regular old grocery store. And you come in through these gates. And once you have the app, and it, you scan the app with, through the gate, and then you just pick stuff off the shelf. And you put it in your basket, and then you, you put it in a bag, and then you just walk out of the store. And it's paid. And that's cool, except, of course, you know, the big question of like, what does this mean for like cashier jobs and stuff like that? Absolutely valid question, and one that economists and policymakers and everybody will need to discuss. But for the purposes of our discussion, what I'm really talking about here is one thing. As you open that app, it gives you this onboarding, and it tells you that anything you take off the shelf, the shelf is automatically added to your cart, your virtual cart. So since that happens, don't take products off the shelf for anyone else. Now, I don't know about you, but as soon as I read this, this was kind of like, red flag. Wait a minute. I help people in grocery stores all the time. Like, I'm tall. I don't know if that's evident from out there in the audience. And there's many taller people than me in this room. Um, but, you know, it's nice if someone can't reach that you can reach it for them. Or maybe it's an old person who can't bend over and I can barely do it myself. But, you know, I like to help. But you just got charged for that thing. And it's easy enough to say, like, well, OK, we won't do that in the Amazon Go store. But it just told you there's going to be 3,000 of those by 2021. This is Amazon we're talking about. This is going to be the future of retail. So now, OK, we're not going to do this in any store. We're not going to help anyone else in any store, lest we get charged for that thing. Well, and then maybe Amazon will fix this, and that's fine. But how long would it be if they didn't fix it before we weren't just helping people, weren't just not helping people in, in stores, but not helping people in general because kind of we got used to it. We got used to the fact that you just don't do that anymore. No, we didn't do that since about 2018 or so, I think is when people stopped helping each other. <laughs> and it's not really that far-fetched. And the point is not so much that this is a flawed uh, design decision, it's that experience at scale does change culture because experience at scale is culture. So that's why these design decisions matter so much. They matter because every little decision that you make, when it gets automated, when it gets put inside intelligent systems and accelerated through scale, when data can model it and software can accelerate it, and automation can amplify it, and culture can adopt it, you're really talking about a very different level of impact of your design work. So there's a few questions we could ask to try to alleviate the absurdity at scale. Uh, these questions are in Tech Humanist, and they will be in the slides that you'll get after. So you might ask, like, how could this experience impact culture, and how could it imp impact brand at scale? What's the purpose of the experience that we're rolling out? How will we measure its success? What will happen 
in our business if this particular experience is successful beyond our wildest dreams. Um, it, like, for example, would we need to pivot the entire business to support that product we're rolling out because it is more successful than anything else we have ever launched? Uh, and are we prepared to support it if it happens? What will happen if it flops? All of these kind of nuanced questions are realistic questions that we should be discussing with our teams as we embark on design projects for new products, for new campaigns, for new experiences, not to slow us down, not to make us kind of have analysis paralysis or stop too long over it, but just to make sure we're having the discussion, that we're thinking about how these experiences are going to affect humanity as they scale, because they will affect humanity as they scale. It's critically important that we understand that. Because here's what happens if we don't. <laughs> This is a comic drawn for me by my friend Rob Cottingham, who does the uh, Noise to Signal comic. If you've ever seen it, it's great. Uh, but this is his interpretation of tech humanism, or kind of the lack thereof. And I don't know if you can read the caption, but it says, it's getting harder and harder to hold on to my humanity, but wow, is it easy to track my Amazon deliveries. I mean, it's not so far-fetched. <laughs> the next principle of machine-led human experiences is to automate empathy. And that may sound like it's a contradiction in some ways, like, well, if it's empathetic, wouldn't it not be automated? But again, this is about making sure that we're preparing for a world in which business, which is the main driver of accelerating technology, of emerging technology, is increasingly creating machine-led experiences and that we can create as much meaning and value and human dimension to those experiences as we possibly can so that we live in a world where there is some kindness and human value and, and nuance in these interactions and we're not in a dystopia that has been automated beyond all human c compassion. Uh, <laughs> How many of you remember the Seinfeld episode where Kramer got a new phone number and it was one digit off from Movie Phone? Oh, Movie Phone, they just shut down their app too. <laughs> but if you remember, if you're old enough, you remember Movie Phone was an actual phone number. And uh, so in this episode, Kramer got this new phone number, one digit off from Movie Phone. And he decided that the easiest thing to do was just to pretend to be Movie Phone. Um, except that it's a touch-tone service, and so he's saying, like, you know, what's the zip code of where you want to see a movie? And then it was George who was entering the zip code. But it's a touch-tone system, so obviously Kramer couldn't understand the tones, and he said, why don't you just tell me what movie you want to see? And in a way, I think this is a little bit like what's happening with an agile approach to automation right now. There's a lot of experiments going on in business with chatbots and robots and other kinds of deployments of emerging technology, and they aren't all completely real. They aren't all completely well-developed. They're just kind of shadow puppet versions of chatbots and robots. They're just kind of like the minimum viable product, the very, 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 very tiny version that's going to face the customer, that's going to give some sense of what will happen if a person interacts with this bot and does this work in our context. So this is something you can actually do. I don't like the duplicitousness of it, but I like the idea that you can take the, hum the movie phone Kramer model and use it for what's good about it, which is to use human interaction to gather patterns about what's needed. So you can look at the, the interactions that take place, uh, that would take place via chat, like Facebook Messenger or other chat platforms, uh, and say, what, what is it that people might want to accomplish via chat that we can, we can achieve with a chat bot? A lot of uh, banks are doing this for very simple functions like uh, password changes. So if all you want is to change your password on your account, then it might pop up a little chat function in the website and be able to interact with you to help you facilitate that password change. And in some cases, some banks are finding that that frees up about 40 or 50 percent of their customer support team's time, and in theory allows them to focus in a more nuanced way on the other calls coming in. But realistically, it probably means that some of that staff is going to be displaced from those jobs. We hope to, and that will mean to higher order roles where they can oversee that automation and help develop more nuance in it. That is the ideal. But that's what's coming. 
So by doing that, you can start with if-then statements. You can start by saying like, well, they may want to change their password, so we'll provide this password uh, interaction. But you'll want to work to find the nuance beyond the if-then statement. Like, if someone's asking to change their password because some uh, stalker X has access to the account, well, that might require some human intervention and right, might require some empathy. Uh, so it would work to create some sort of flags around, some boundaries around the experience that say, all right, well, now let's get to where either you're going to forward this to a human to have this interaction or start gathering what patterns look like about an empathetic response to if this is an actual pattern that we see emerging, something that starts to create some softness around those interactions. But we have to be sure we're, we're um, automating meaningful patterns, because arbitrary patterns tend to emerge here, too. We can see things happening, and they may look like something that's meaningful, but it's actually just something that's like popping up here and there. And they may not necessarily relate to our purpose at large. So remember, the purpose is the shape meaning takes in business. So if the pattern you're seeing does not relate to purpose, then it probably is not meaningful. Worth noting, perhaps, but not necessarily worth automating. So that's a meaningful distinction. One way or the other, we cannot leave meaning up to machines to determine. It is going to be up to us to figure out what is meaningful about interactions and to create the, the interactions meaningfully. So the reason is that <laughs> AI is not that good at nuance yet. Yet. I do point out yet. Uh, this, this is a um, pretty famous image recognition problem, muffin versus puppy. Uh, <laughs> but, and it's largely been solved by better algorithms, but there are going to be continual versions of, by the way, here's some more, uh, <laughs> continual versions of this problem that emerge. And the takeaway here is that machines aren't going to always be as good, at, as good at figuring out what's meaningful about images, about video, about content, about experiences. You can have machines doing AI kind of curation of images, like if you have uh, stringers uh, in journalism out in the field and they're sending in a bunch of photos and AI can go like, oh, here's pictures that show the, the thing that you're trying to write a story about but it's going to be a human eye for the time being that's going to be able to say, oh, that's the narrative I'm actually trying to tell. That image shows the kind of clear relationship between this entity and that entity. That's the one I want to feature. So there's still this kind of these emerging roles that are going to be the new future of work. Like, I think like nuance engineer is maybe a thing we might see, or a curator in a completely new type of approach to curation because humans generally do do nuance well, because nuance is meaning, and meaning making is something we have a real knack for. So we'll continue to add value in these increasingly automated economies by being human, by maintaining our connection to our senses, to our, our intellect, our understanding of the world around us, to our understanding of context, and to our understanding of meaning. And I hope, that we will continue to use human data respectfully. This is another principle to these machine-led experiences. Human data is what's powering these interactions. Like I said, it's the physical and digital connection. When we talk about digital transformation, when it, you hear this term anywhere, I feel like it's a little bit of a misnomer. Like we all kind of made the transformation to digital the moment we started sitting in front of screens, like transacting in bits and bytes all the time. That's not really the big news. The big news is data that transforms these experiences much more completely. And the thing about that is that it's about agility with data. It's about being able, it's about different parts of business being able to see more clearly into other parts of business. And it is entirely about business drivers, let's be clear. All of this is, is being driven forward by some business wanting to make more money. But it's about agility with data. And that data is largely about people. It's our movements through space. It's our purchases, our behaviors, our interactions with each other. That's what's generating the data. 
by and large, that's powering the business analytics and information systems that are connected behind the scenes that businesses are using to digitally transform and create more machine-led experiences for us humans to consume. We are the engine to this whole thing. And you are creating the experiences, you are designing these experiences, so I want you to design them with mindful understanding of what, how it fits into this whole system. Because analytics are people, like at some level, when you're looking at analytics, when you're looking at data, it's so easy to abstract it, and it's like, oh, this is just the entries and exits. But that's people, that's people telling you something about what they want, what they need, it's a really good opportunity to think about that. And it's a really important moment to remember that machines are what we encode of ourselves. Machines are what we encode of ourselves. So why wouldn't, as, as these machine-led experiences scale, why wouldn't we encode our best selves, our most enlightened selves, our most egalitarian views, and our most evolved understandings? I really hope that's what we're going to do. And I hope that we will use our data to make more meaning. Because relevance is a form of respect. Relevance, like the ability to create these targeted and, and, and you know, kind of momentarily uh, perfect moments is a form of saying, hey, I see you, and I see the context you're in, and I'm trying to create something that matters to you. Of course you're trying to sell something to me too, I get that. But it's also saying, look, I'm trying to do a thing, you're trying to do a thing, I'm trying to create alignment between what we want to do here. And the more we create that alignment, the more there's a shared understanding, the more there's meaning. Meaning is that shared understanding. However, discretion is a form of respect too. Let's remember that as well. <laughs> so we can't, we can't be creepy about the data we know about people and we can't create experiences that are like, oh, hey, Joe Schmo, I saw that you were visiting such and such the other day and I know that you like this kind of waffle, so would you like to go over here to the, and I'm like, don't do that, that's creepy. The companies do it all the time. So, Protect human data excessively. If you are the standard bearer in your company, in design decisions, in product teams, in project teams, for this value, you will have achieved tech humanism like nothing else. If you are always the person who in every discussion goes like, what are we doing to make sure we're good about the human data that we're collecting and using? What are we doing to make sure that we're being careful about this human data? I swear that will be the best representation of tech humanism that I can think of. And then this one goes a little beyond the scope of your roles, but it's really important too, that as we get efficiency in business from automation, I believe that it's imperative that we continue to reinvest some of those gains into humanity and human experiences. I think it's important to put that bug in business leaders' ears. And so you can be that voice yourselves within your company, but I am also being that voice too. And my book really, really speaks to this. Just know that this is part of the equation. That, that as companies get more and more efficient and as they continue to automate jobs, this is a map that shows a study that was done of what jobs, uh, what cities have the most jobs that are potentially automatable in the United States, and I've got New York, New Jersey uh, metro region where I live zoomed in, and it's over 55% of jobs are considered potentially automatable. The other thing to remember about this, and I wrote, wrote about this in the book a lot, is that this disproportionately affects people of color and minorities and poor people, people who are already going to be hit the hardest. But these are truck drivers, for example, cashiers, jobs in which uh, minorities, people of color, and poor people have a disproportionate percentage of these jobs. So we are definitely tipping the scales even further in imbalance. And we need to know that. Because we need to be thinking about opportunities to create the best futures for the most people. And if we're not thinking about how to reinvest gains into systems that actually lift all people up, then we are missing that opportunity. And it's a crime to miss that opportunity because we are going to have so much surplus with automation and AI. So we can repurpose human skills and qualities in the short term and in the medium term to higher quality roles as some of those jobs become 
displaced and augmented and replaced by automation, we can look for ways to put people into roles that now have to do with automation. And humans have always been really creative about this through time and finding new ways to reinvent around economic and technology changes. I have no doubt that we will find new ways to engage with the, the new economy and the new systems. I just think we need to be very, very mindful of that. <clears throat> so here are those four principles again. Don't just automate the menial, automate the meaningful. Automate empathy as well. Use human data respectfully. Remember, that's your charge. I really believe that's going to be your best opportunity to advocate as a tech humanist. And then for your company to reinvest gains, some of the gains at least, into humanity as a whole and human experiences. So the big question that we, are, we have an opportunity to ask in this moment is, we always have this opportunity to ask this question in business, is what is it that we're trying to do and what are we trying to do at scale? That's our purpose, right? But now we have so much potential to take that scale and make it go like crazy, take that purpose and really accelerate it and amplify it. So we have to ask that question really, really intentionally, really clearly, it can be ap appropriate at a project level and a design team level and a product level too. So make sure this is a question we're asking. For me, incidentally, my purpose, what I'm trying to do at scale is create more meaningful human experiences. And I hope that I do that by talking with all of you and talking with the other audiences I talk with and trying to get people thinking about how to approach these design challenges more mindfully and create more meaning in these systems that will eventually become automated and scale like never before. Because the truth is business is not going to be successful long term without scaling through digitization and automation. It just won't. That's table stakes anymore. So everything is going to be about that acceleration through digital and through automation and artificial intelligence. But humanity won't be successful long term without meaning. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing to make that a successful integration. Thank you. Thank you.